the Sirius Symposium. Uh, we have today as our guest Professor Ed Felton of Princeton University. Uh, Ed is well known for those who have been working in areas of security, privacy, policy issues. Uh, he's had a number of notable developments uh, in his career and uh, they include uh, some very interesting work in digital rights management and some of the failings thereof, which have made him all kinds of friends in the recording industry. <laughs> and uh, most recently, he's been very involved in some of the issues involved with security and accuracy of voting machines. Uh, he recently also founded and is director of the Center for Information Technology Policy, in addition to his work at CS. And uh, we're very fortunate to have him here today. So please welcome Professor Ed Felton. Thanks. All right, so you may have heard that electronic voting machines are uh, pose security problems. That's true. I'll talk today a little bit about why that is, the nature of the problems. I'll talk also a little bit about how it happened. Um, but I want to move beyond the usual narrative about electronic voting and its problems to talk some about how the use of computers in voting actually can be an opportunity to make things better. So. These machines are maybe a little radioactive, but we can make things better. And this is joint work with uh, three graduate students at Princeton, Joe Calandrino, Ari Feldman, and Alex Halderman. All right, our story starts, the story of electronic voting in the US really picked up in 2000. You may remember this guy from the uh, Florida presidential recount in, in 2000. Uh, and what happened here was you had an extremely close election that ended up deciding the presidency. And a lot of people said, this is no way to conduct an election. You had all these stories of hanging chads and dimpled chads and recounts and, uh, and lawsuits going to the Supreme Court and all that. Uh, people that said we can do better. Congress responded to this problem by passing a, a, a law called the Help America Vote Act, um, which provided about $4 billion in funding to states to upgrade their voting machines to new technologies by November 2006. Lots of money for the states, but they had to spend it soon. The result was that a number of electronic voting vendors took machines that had been research prototypes and uh, pushed them into production. And many states bought them. These are so-called DREs, direct recording electronic voting machines. And uh, it's called direct recording electronic because the machine stores the votes, records them directly in the electronic memory of the voting machine. And in many of these cases, the electronic record was the only record, is the only record, of the votes as cast. All right, so DREs are computerized. They have certain advantages over, um, over older paper-based voting systems, but they have also certain significant disadvantages, the biggest one of which is that DREs are computers. Uh, a DRE is basically just a laptop computer in a different package, and that means because DREs are computers, they're subject to all the computer problems, bugs, viruses, various kinds of attacks, and rootkits, and so on. If you're a computer scientist, or if you're a person versed in computer security, this is no surprise to you, probably. But if you're a, if you're a public official who is investing in voting machines, this probably did come as a surprise to you. Computer scientists got somewhat alarmed by this tran uh, transition to DREs, knowing what can go wrong when you use computers for these purposes. But nonetheless, um, these machines got used. I want to show you, um, as an example, what it's like to vote on this machine. This is the Diebold AccuVote TS uh, v electronic voting machine. And it and its brother, the AccuVote TSX, uh, have been used in recent elections by about 10% of US voters. This is one of the most popular DREs. So you walk up to this thing, and you see this on the screen, uh, something like this. You see this um, prompt that says, insert your card. When you checked in at the front desk in the polling place, you were given a little smart card, something that looks like a credit card, um, and that was encoded to say that you're authorized to vote. You stick the smart card in. Now you see something like this. Uh, here we have an uh, imaginary race for president between George Washington and Benedict Arnold. Uh, you choose your candidate by pushing uh, your finger against the screen uh, in the box next to the candidate you want. When you're happy, you click the next button on the bottom and you go on to another screen, you go through all of these races, and in the end you see something like this, which might be hard to read, but what it is is a summary screen that shows all of the races and all of the candidates you've chosen. And if you're happy with this, you press the cast ballot button in the lower right. If you're unhappy, you press the review ballot button and you can go back and change things. Okay. Um, 
Now, Diebold, the, uh, the company that made this, uh, had a history, had, has a, a history of secrecy around this technology. They used non-disclosure agreements to prevent states and counties from allowing independent security audits of the system. Um, and so, uh, even though there was suspicion on the part of computer scientists, there was not really an opportunity for independent researchers to look at the machines. Nonetheless, Diebold's source code leaked out onto the internet in 2003, uh, and there was a major study of the source code without access to a real machine by researchers at Johns Hopkins University, Rice University, and elsewhere. And they found um, major problems, major problems, um, including some really elementary computer security mistakes, like always using the same password, hardwiring that password into the source code, and having that password be 1111. Um, Diebold responded to this um, in uh, what I think is fair to say is a non-constructive way. Uh, making legal threats, um, uh, personal attacks on the researchers, and etc. Um, in addition, in two, later in 2003, internal an, an archive of internal Diebold emails that um, also leaked out in the net, and that revealed a lot of poor security practices by the developers. You could see the developers discussing problems, and you could see the software development process in in action. Nonetheless, as of 2003, indeed until 2006, um, no independent researchers had ever gotten hold of a real machine. But that changed in 2006 when our research group got hold of uh, an actual Diebold voting machine configured uh, as, it was, as, um, as if for the 2002 Maryland election. Uh, we got this machine uh, lawfully from an anonymous private party, someone who asked not to be identified. The software in it is the 2002 version, the version that was actually used in most places in the US in the 2002 election and in some places in 2004. So this software was a little bit out of date, but it had been fully through the federal certification process and had been used in real elections. And this was, to our knowledge, the first complete independent public security audit of any DRE. So we wanted to do research on this thing, and our research goals were basically these. We wanted to conduct an independent security audit. We wanted to confirm or disconfirm the findings of previous researchers, people like Harry Hursty, the paper by uh, Yoshi Kono and colleagues, that's the Johns Hopkins Rice paper that I talked about before. We wanted to, if we found threats, thought we had identified threats, we wanted to verify them by building demonstration attacks to show that, to convince ourselves that what uh, the problems we had found were real. And we wanted to figure out how to do better. And we felt there were a lot of parties who could benefit from seeing this kind of research done, starting with the obvious people, voters and candidates who care about election integrity, election officials, policymakers, and also other researchers. We wanted to provide a case study for other researchers to learn about the technology. All right, so we got this thing. We tore it apart. We looked at the hardware. Here's a, here's a, a photo of the motherboard. Um, and you can see it looks a lot like a PC or laptop motherboard. You can see the processor, the SH3 CPU up there. Um, you can see the SD RAM, the, the main RAM. You can see an EEPROM which is a removable chip that holds the, uh, the basic code that's used to boot the machine. You can see the flash memory, which serves as stable storage, the equivalent of a disk drive, logically, and, and all of this. So we analyzed this hardware to figure out what it was doing, to figure out what opportunities there might be to modify it. We also took this, um, we also looked into this EEPROM, which had the boot code, the bootloader, and we pulled it out and put it into an EEPROM reader, and we got out the machine code which we then reverse engineered laboriously by using a tool like this. This is IDA Pro, which is uh, a, dis a, a disassembler. And what you see over here on the left is the um, assembly language uh, instructions uh, for a piece of this code. And over on the right, you see the uh, comments, the commentary that um, the graduate students who were doing this reverse engineering work put in. So we laboriously disassembled this, um, this software to figure out what it was doing, how it was working, and in particular to look at what kind of security safeguards were built into the, um, into the system. All right. So um, our study had three major findings. The first was that malicious software that, uh, if, if running on the voting machine, can steal votes in, in a manner that is practically undetectable. By stealing votes, what I mean is that if the voter pushes the button for candidate A, the vote can be recorded for candidate B instead, or it can be recorded correctly for candidate A and then changed later. The malicious software can change, uh, can change votes or misrecord them. It can do this in a way that is effectively impossible to detect. Uh, and even though the machine keeps backup copies of the ballots and keeps uh, audit logs and so on of the events that happened, 
all of these backup copies, all of these audit logs are available to be modified by the malicious software. So it can construct a completely self-consistent set of records, um, which, uh, which look absolutely fine, but uh, just have the disadvantage of not corresponding to what actually happened. All right. Um, so we have a demo that we, that we worked up um, to, to show this, and, I, and we did this on various places. I did this before a congressional hearing. I did it on CNN and Fox News. Um, but the demo looks like this. It's this simulated election between George Washington and Benedict Arnold. You put this up in front of the news anchor or congressman. You ask them to choose between George Washington and Benedict Arnold. Interesting sociology experiment. Most of them choose, choose George Washington, but a few of them choose Benedict Arnold just to be contrary. Um, and I might tell you afterward, after the camera's off, who chose Benedict Arnold. Anyway, um, uh, the, you hold this election. You let five people vote. Let's say that the five of them vote for George Washington. Now you, uh, now you tell the voting machine that you're a poll worker and it's the end of election day and let's print out the results of the, of the voting. And here is the paper record that the voting machine prints out, which tallies the results. And you can see in the highlighted section that um, it's George Washington 2, Benedict Arnold 3. The votes were misrecorded. Actually, they were changed just after they were recorded by malicious software that we had put into the voting machine. Now, it maybe requires, it, it requires some technical expertise to make this malicious software, but to actually use it uh, doesn't need to be hard. Uh, we cooked up an easy user interface that um, someone could use with a little slider bar down here in the bottom to determine what fraction of the votes uh, Benedict Donald should get. Um, and um, so you could operate this, say, uh, move the slider to 55%, which is what we did in the demo that I showed you a minute ago. Um, and the malicious software would make sure that Benedict Arnold got at least this percentage of the vote um, and would flip votes as necessary to make sure that was the case. Okay, so malicious software can change the results of an election. And again, if you're a computer scientist and you think about it much at all, this should be pretty obvious. The machine will do whatever it's programmed to do, and it can be programmed to do just about anything. Second finding that anyone with physical access to the machine or the, or the removable memory card that's used to store the votes uh, can install malicious code in as little as one minute. It takes literally about a minute of wall clock time uh, if you're alone with the machine to insert malicious code. Uh, and, and, and this would give you an idea. Uh, on the side of the machine, there's this little metal door, uh, which, uh, and if you have a key, you can put the key in, open the door, and that gives you access. Uh, right, so... Uh, and that will give you access to the memory card, which, um, which, which stores the votes and so on. Um, now, one of the things we discovered, or that had been discovered, which we verified, is that the key that opened our machine was the exact same key that opened every single machine that was used in the states of Maryland and Georgia. In fact, as far as we can tell, every single Diebold AccuVote TS voting machine uh, in the United States can be opened with the same key. That's not good security engineering. Um, the lock is also easily picked. Uh, one of the graduate students in our group can consistently pick this lock in, uh, in five seconds or less. Um, anyone with lock picking skill can, can do this. And in fact, for a while, we used this lock as, uh, as the first lock people should try when, um, when learning to pick locks. <laughs> when you get the thing open, uh, you, there's a memory card inside. This is a PCM CIA card, um, but uh, slotted into it is a regular, um, uh, regular flash memory module of the sort that uh, is commonly used in digital cameras. So uh, we actually had a spare memory card equipment just laying around uh, in our offices already, so it's not exotic equipment. All right. And once you get this open, um, all you need to do is stick in your own memory card that has the malicious software on it. There's a little red button you push down here to, re, uh, to, to reboot the machine. Uh, and on the reboot, the, uh, the machine will helpfully detect the malicious software on the memory card and automatically install it with no safeguards, no authentication of the code. Any code that's on that, um, that's on that memory card in a file with a particular magic name will get read in and, and will overwrite um, either the bootloader or the operating system kernel, depending on which, uh, exactly what name the attacker has given the file. So it's very easy to uh, override this. Now, I told you about the keys, the very same key being used on all these machines. It's even worse than that. Uh, the very same key is used um, widely in jukeboxes to open the access or service panels on jukeboxes and in hotel minibars. This is, in fact, perhaps the most common key in the United States of any kind. Um, 
Oh, well, other than those sort of straight pin things you use to, uh, to, you know, to lock your bathroom at home. Um, it's very commonly used for these applications. It's very commonly used in uh, office furniture, file cabinets, and desk drawers, and so on. Um, and the, the way we discovered this is that a member of our technical staff actually looked at the key and said, that's funny, I have one like this at home in my penny cup. He, uh, it had been his desk drawer key in an old job, and he brought it in and tried it, and sure enough, it opened the... Um, Sure enough, it opened the machine. Um, so that's not good. Um, in fact, you can buy these keys by the gross on the internet. Um, stamped on the key is an alphanumeric code, which I'm not going to tell you. But if you were to Google that code, it would take you immediately to a place where you could buy these keys in bulk. Also not good. But it gets even worse than this. Um, a um, uh, Diebold has on their, had on their website um, a, uh, uh, a service that let election officials buy extra keys. Now, it wasn't as bad as you might think. You and I couldn't sign up and buy extra keys this way. You had to authenticate that you were an actual, or at least uh, assert that you were an actual um, election official. But Diebold um, helpfully put at, on the bottom left of this page a picture of the key. It was a high-res picture, which had a very nicely defined view of all of the teeth of the key. And uh, someone in... Um, and an independent researcher discovered this, and they used the picture to cut keys, which they mailed to us, and they opened our machine. So this, just this picture, I've blacked it out here, um, was enough to make your own key that would open the machines, if you somehow didn't know the six-digit alphanumeric code that was printed on the key. This is, very bad, um, this is very bad security engineering, and it has the wonderful virtue that um, you don't need to be a, a computer scientist to understand it. All right, which is great for convincing policymakers that there actually is a problem because we can talk all day about you know, uh, unchangeable encryption keys and the lack of encryption or the use of a, um, of a cyclic redundancy code for, uh, to, uh, for integrity checking of, of data and all that. Um, it just doesn't have the impact of saying it's the same darn key you can buy on the internet. All right. Our third finding uh, in the study was that malicious, the malicious code can spread automatically and silently from voting machine to voting machine in the form of a voting machine virus. And we made a prototype voting machine virus that would spread from voting machine to voting machine on its own once you infected one machine or one memory card. So you imagine that you have, um, on, on, this, uh, on this slide, you have an infected voting machine up on the top and a non-infected one on the bottom. Now you're going to stick a memory card into the infected one, say, in order to program it with the ballot for a new election. So let's program the first machine with the ballot. The voting machine infects the card. Now we're going to program the second voting machine in the polling place, and the card then infects the machine. The uh, virus would spread from machines to cards and cards to machines. And in ordinary pre- and post-election um, procedures, these cards would be moved from machine to machine, so an infection could spread in a real situation from one machine uh, to a large number of machines in just one election cycle. Yes? Just a quick question, or two quick questions. First, the, now these cards, do they need to be in the machine when the machine is in operation? or is this Yes. Okay. The cards do two things. Well, three things maybe. They're used to program the machine before the election by, um, pr um, by um, copying the ballot onto the machine. They're used to hold the votes during the election and then carry the votes back to the county clerk's office for tabulation afterward, and they're used to install software updates. Um, so, um, and because there's no authentication and very poor key to access control on, uh, uh, on the machine, uh, a malicious person who has access to the machine can do all of those things. Uh, they can change the ballot programming, they can change the votes, they can install malicious software. So in, in your uh, earlier example yes. where you put in the the card with malicious code. Yes. Uh, you, you then remove the card with malicious code and put the and original you put the original card back in. Yes. Okay. Right. So the infection goes into the machine. We can then take the uh, the uh, our malicious card um, and throw it away or take it home, and the infection will then spread from that machine. It it spreads naturally from machines to cards and cards to machines, uh, just like a sort of old floppy disk based DOS viruses used to do. Yeah. All right. So. Um, so that's the result of our study of the Diebold system. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about a later study. This is the California top-to-bottom study, 
Uh, Deborah Bowen, who is who's pictured in the center of, he, of this, is the Secretary of State of the State of California, so therefore the chief, chief election official of California. Uh, she ran for office on an e-voting reform platform and was elected. And one of the first things that she did was to set up what she called the top-to-bottom study that picked the three most common DRE voting machines used in California and subjected them to serious study by teams of academic experts, um, including this team, which consists of five of my graduate students. The results of this study, uh, and, and they studied um, and uh, a series of a set of different academic study teams looked at the Hart Inner Civic, Sequoia, and Diebold voting machines, and they found for Hart um, it was subject to malicious code viruses that could change votes, and it um, violated voter privacy. That is, that it was possible to reconstruct who had cast which ballots after the election just using the machine's records. Same thing for Sequoia, both um, subject to uh, to, to uh, vote stealing viruses, and. Um, and um, not protecting voter privacy. Same thing for the Diebold system. A slightly different Diebold system than we studied before, slightly different software, but the same kinds of problems. Uh, so Secretary Bowen conditionally decertified all of these voting machines in California. Uh, since then, the state of Ohio has done a similar study called the Everest study with, with similar results. Okay, so that's sort of the situation. From a public policy point of view, this is a disaster. Uh, and the obvious question is, how in the world did this happen? Um, there's not a short or easy answer to that question. I could actually give a whole other talk about that. Um, but uh, regardless of why it happened, and it really required a, uh, I, I guess the short answer is it required a whole series of um, bad luck and bad decisions um, and, uh, and risk factors. Anyway, uh, the, the question arose, what should we do? Now, one answer that you sometimes hear, and you see it here, uh, what, right, what to do, well, and you see it here, is the call to dispense with computers entirely in voting. So this is an entry from Daily Coast, which is a very popular um, political blog of the liberal bent. And, um, and uh, it says, call your congressman and tell them that we want to ban all use of computers in voting. Let's go back to pieces of paper on which the voter marks, uh, writes with a pen or pencil, counted by a human being. This is a system that we've used for a long time, and we're now, by now, well acquainted with its failure modes and with the sorts of fraud that it allows, um, due to tampering with ballot boxes and the like. Um, this is not, of course, the answer. Uh, here we have a human being counting a, uh, a, a, a ballot that the voter marked manually. So um, this may not be the best solution anyway. In any case, electronic voting, the use of computers has certain advantages over, uh, over uh, all paper systems. Voters seem to prefer electronic systems um, in, for a number of reasons. Um, it gives you faster reporting of the results, which is not only uh, a nice thing to have in a now, now, now media age, but it also is a security property because there's a window of vulnerability between the time you close the polls and the time that you tabulate the votes. And you can keep that window shorter by reporting uh, and tabulating votes more quickly. There's less time for mischief. There's less time you have to guard the media and the machines and so on. You have fewer undervotes, potentially, uh, because the machines can help the voter know that they're casting an illegal vote. If the voter tries to mark a second candidate for president, the machine can say, no, um, that's a problem. If you want to vote for this candidate, you need to uh, clear your vote for the other one. You can warn the voter that they're maybe making casting an invalid vote, and the hope is you get fewer invalid votes. You have potentially improved accessibility. You can have different interfaces for people who uh, are blind. You can give them an audio interface. People who, don't, who lack fine motor control, you can give them a different user interface with great big buttons, uh, and so on. You can present the ballot to people in a different language if you, uh, if you want to do that. So maybe improved accessibility, and potentially improved increased security. I've put that in red with an asterisk, because um, Although we know in the research community methods that we could use uh, to, uh, for example, involving certain uses of cryptography that would make voting more secure um, by taking advantage of what computers can do, none of the actual voting systems that are in use uh, ta really take advantage of those fully. Nonetheless, electronic voting has advantages. So I believe the solution is not to throw computers out entirely, but to figure out how to do better in using computers in voting. And I want to spend the rest of the time talking about how I think that would work. OK. Um, the first piece of the answer, and this is something that uh, 
uh, computer scientists who have studied this issue, um, I think, mostly agree upon, uh, is to use a system that keeps both electronic and paper records of the ballot, of the ballot, with the paper record something that is viewable and verifiable by the voter directly. And there are basically two kinds of systems that can do this. On the top here, uh, we have a touchscreen or DRE system, which has had a voter verifiable paper trail added to it. So the voter goes to the touchscreen, they choose their candidates. Uh, when they say they're done, the system then prints out a paper record that says, here's, uh, here's how I think you're, you wanted to vote. And the voter can look at that and say yes or no. If they say no, then the computer prints void all over it and, um, uh, and discards it or actually keeps it, but, um, but keeps it marked void. If the voter says, yes, it's what I wanted, the ballot is saved in, um, in a, some sort of a ballot box so that the paper record is available afterward. The other option to get both electronic and paper records at the end of election day is what's called precinct count optical scan system. Here the idea is you have a, a, a paper ballot that the voter marks by hand with a pen or pencil. Uh, and as soon as the voter has marked the ballot, you run it through a, a scanner, and the scanner will read it. It will check to see whether it's valid. If it appears to be invalid, say a double vote in some race, it will kick it back to the voter so the voter can fix the problem. If the ballot seems to be valid, the machine will make an electronic record of the ballot, and it will also feed the ballot through into a ballot box where it's collected later. Either way, at the end of election day, you have the electronic record that was captured right then when the voter cast the, cast the vote, and you have a paper record which was, at least in principle, um, verified by the voter. Now, why is it good to have electronic plus, plus paper records? Uh, the answer has to do, I think, with the failure modes of electronic versus paper systems. They have different kinds of failure modes. With paper ballots, you're worried about physical tampering with the, um, with the ballot box and with the ballots. With electronic records, you're worried about what, for lack of a better term, I'll call cyber tampering. Someone uh, changing the code in the voting machine is really the, uh, the attack you worry most about. Uh, with paper ballots, you worry about retail level fraud. That is somebody uh, messing with ballot, ballot boxes, one ballot box at a time. Uh, it requires handling a large amount of material to large amount of stuff, maybe in a large number of places to steal a large number of votes. With electronic records, you're worried about wholesale fraud. Someone is going to commit a bad act once in one place, and it's going to have a widespread effect. Retail attacks are usually easier to carry out, but wholesale attacks have worse consequences if they are carried out. With paper ballots, you worry about primarily about fraud that happens after the election. Someone gets to the ballot box and puts stuff in or takes stuff out or just throws the whole ballot box away. With electronic records, you're worried primarily about tampering before the election, something that's going to change the software in the voting machine. And if the, in fact, if the electronic record is recorded in a way that uses cryptography cleverly, then you can ensure that if there has not been tampering um, before the ballot is recorded, that any tampering after that is detected. So what you can see when you compare these across on this uh, list is that you see different kinds of failure modes uh, in the two cases. And in general, when you have redundancy, and the redundant systems have different failure modes, then you tend to get greater security and, by the way, greater reliability as well. Uh, an attack that modified both the electronic and paper records in a way that was consistent would have to involve physical tampering and cyber tampering, would have to involve both retail and wholesale fraud modes, and would have to in probably involve a component before the election and a component after the election. That's more difficult to carry out. Okay, so paper plus electronic records um, uh, offer potentially greater security. On a public policy front, uh, there's been legislation proposed by Representative Rush Holt, who's actually my congressman in Princeton, um, H.R. 811, the Voter Confidence and Increased Accessibility Act. Um, this is now currently in the House of Representatives. There's a similar bill in the Senate. Um, it would uh, require that there be a voter verifiable paper record and that there be random manual audits to compare the paper and electronic records after the election. It would, uh, it would require increased access, not unlimited, but increased access to voting software and source code to let officials verify security. And it would provide some additional money for the states to, uh, to, uh, to improve their voting systems. This bill is, as I said, in the House. Um, there's a similar bill in the Senate. Both of them are stuck, very unlikely to get passed. There's been strong opposition from state and local officials to this because, um, for a number of reasons, but um, uh, I think largely because they worry about the cost and complexity 
uh, associated with, uh, with changing to a different voting system. Uh, because this bill has been passed, there's a simplified version of the, uh, of the Holt bill, which was recently introduced, I think this week, if I remember correctly, H.R. 5036, that says basically this, that if your state used paperless voting in 2006, and if it buys better technology for use in 2008, then the federal government will help pay for it. This doesn't require states to do anything, but it offers them an incentive to move in the direction that, um, that Representative Holt and, uh, and many other people um, would like them to. So this is the light version of the Holt bill. It was recently introduced. Maybe it will pass. Maybe it will take effect for the 2008 election, um, but don't bet the House on it. All right. So um, we have movement maybe at the federal level, maybe slow, maybe not at all, uh, toward requiring, um, toward requiring a, 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 an election system that uh, keeps and uses paper records. We also have significant progress in the states and probably more progress being made in the states. Uh, so let's now look forward and ask ourselves, uh, when we get to a place where we have paper and electronic records, what should we do? We have this idea that we need to, um, that we need to uh, use the redundancy of these records. Um, well, first of all, the first thing to note, so how should we do this? The first thing to note is redundancy only helps if we actually use both records. If we just take the paper records and put them in a warehouse and never look at them, then they don't do us any good from a security point of view. Um, so, but, but the challenge here is that the electronic records are fast and cheap to tally. They're the things that you would like to tally for cost and, and speed and efficiency reasons. But the paper records are very expensive, and paper records, unfortunately, are very expensive and slow to tally. But the paper record is what the voter saw. Uh, and if you want that link to something that the voter actually saw, then you need to incorporate the paper record into the system. So what are we going to do about this? How should we use these paper records that, on the one hand, are slow and expensive and inconvenient to handle, but on the other hand, are the only thing that we can link to the voter's intent? Well, one thing we could do is use a machine to count the paper records. So we're going to take all these paper records, we're going to throw them into some big sheet-fed scanner, we're going to scan them through, have some software that, that reads them and does optical character recognition or whatever, and counts the votes. That's unfortunately risky. The whole reason we have this paper record is we didn't want to trust some machine running software that's hard to examine um, in, in, in counting the votes. Um, switching to a different machine is not really the, the thing we're looking for. We could count all of the paper records by hand. That would uh, have a lot of advantages, but it's really expensive. Very expensive, very slow, and not really practical. So the only thing that is left, and the thing that we're going to have to do, is to check some random subset of the paper records by hand. But how are we going to choose this subset? How are we going to do it? Um, that um, turns out to be a pretty interesting technical research problem. The standard approach to doing this, um, which I'll illustrate here in the state of Sideways, Illinois, is to, um, is, is to uh, take the, the, um, the area, it's divided up into precincts. We're going to pick some precincts at random. Um, we're going to hand count the paper records in those precincts. And in each precinct that we picked, we're going to compare the result of our hand count against the electronic count. And we're going to say they'd better match. If they don't match, that's evidence that something is wrong. OK. Let's get more precise about what we're trying to do. Our goal, to be a little bit more precise, is to establish with high statistical confidence that if we hand counted all of the paper ballots in the whole state, that this would yield the same, that the, that, that count would yield the same winner as the electronic tally. We don't care so much whether the, that that candidate should have won by 5% or 10% or 15%. What we care about is that uh, we got the winner right in the election. So we want to verify that. Um, let's get a little bit more specific in an example. Here we have uh, a hypothetical election, and the post-election tally, the electronic tally, says that Alice got 55% of the votes and Bob got 45% of the votes. Right. In, the, uh, in this scenario, what we, want to, what we want to do is reject the hypothesis, by statistical evidence, reject the hypothesis that more than 5% of the ballots differ between the electronic and paper counts. If more than 5% of the ballots differ, then it might be that if, if say, 6% differ, then it might be that Bob has 51% of the paper ballots and Alice has 49, uh, and that's what we want to avoid. But if we can reject the hypothesis that 5% or more are different, then we know that, the, that a full paper count would establish that Alice was the real winner. Okay. Yes.
that uh, yes. Yeah, so there are systems where you like put the paper records in different stacks and you weigh them, you separate them. Um, well, in order for the first step in doing that was uh, so. Let me repeat the question. Right. So the question is. Um, is that in some places they use a system where you divide the ballots into two piles based on what, who they're cast for, and you just weigh the piles. Uh, and you see, um, and you know, Alice's, Alice's pile should weigh, what is it, 20% more than Bob's pile, roughly. You know, what, you know the proportions of the, what the weights should be. Uh, one of the difficulties of doing this, though, is you have to reliably separate the ballots into two piles in the first place in order to do this. Um, and in order to separate them into piles, you can use a machine. That's a, that's a solution we want to avoid. Or you can do it by hand. So th that's essentially a way of doing a hand count, which is what we're trying to avoid. Huh. Gee. Not, not to be overly pedantic, but wouldn't it be the case that if every ballot was marked with one of those two choices and there were no blank ballots, yes. if there was a difference of 2.5% of the ballots, that would swing the election? In this case, n no, because... You might bring Bob up to 47 and a half, and you might bring Alice down to 52. It would reduce and Alice by two and a half and bring Bob up by two and a half. Right, so that brings you still. Oh, you've got a 10 difference. It's a 10% okay. right, difference, 10 difference. So, right. So we want to reject the, the possibility that, that half of that difference was flipped, right. Um, so how many ballots do, how much do we actually need to, uh, how many places do we actually need to do these hand counts? Um, this, you know, this is, a, this is a pretty easy calculation in probability. Uh, the answer is for 95% confidence level, we need to hand audit about 60 precincts. Uh, so the analysis is just this. Um, um, if we're looking for a 5% error, then we know that at least 5% of the precincts have some discrepancy in them. So every time we pick a precinct, we're throwing a dart at, 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 at a target. The dart has a 5% chance of hitting the bullseye. Throw 60 darts, and you have more than 95% chance that at least one of them hits the bullseye. In a real election, a 60, hand counting 60 precincts costs eh, more or less about $100,000. That's way too much. If you're going to do this in every con congressional district in the U.S., that's $43.5 million. If you want to do it in state assembly races, races for mayor, races for dog catcher, and school board, and so on, uh, we just can't afford to do that. So an alternative approach is instead of picking whole precincts to audit, we're going to pick ballots at random, and we're going to audit those individual ballots. And the logic here is like this. Um, over here on the left, we have large granularity. Imagine that these are precincts. Uh, we have 100 marbles in, um, in the glass. And if we pick a 1% sample, that's one marble. We're probably not going to get a blue marble. That is, we're probably not going to get one of the corrupted precincts. On the right, on the other hand, we have 6,300 beads, of which 10% are blue. If we take a 1% sample of this, 63 beads, it's very likely that we'll get a blue one. So with a 1% sample is way more effective in finding a bad one if the granularity is small than if it's large. And so by switching to individual ballots, uh, we can get a huge improvement in efficiency, as it turns out. So if, for example, how large a sample do we need? Well, here uh, we want to reject the hypothesis that more than 5% of the ballots differ. Um, if, we're gonna, if we're going to audit ballots, we only need to hand, hand audit 60 ballots, because each ballot is a throw of a dart at the dartboard. 60 darts gives us a, uh, a high confidence of hitting the bullseye at least once. Cost is maybe $1,000. Way cheaper. But we don't do this. The reason we don't do this um, is that in order to do a ballot by ballot comparison, we need to be able to match up an electronic record with the corresponding paper record. That is, if we pick, let's say, the middle electronic record in this figure uh, to be recounted, we need to find the matching piece of paper that corresponds to the same voter's vote. And in order to do that, it turns out, we, um, we're going to end up compromising the secret ballot. The secret ballot being, of course, the rule that says that it has to be impossible to match up a vote with an individual voter. Um, uh, this is one of the basic requirements of fair elections, uh, because, and, it, and, it, and it's a really important safeguard against coercion and vote buying. If you can't demonstrate to a third party how you voted, then they can't tell you that they'll break your legs if you don't vote a particular way or fire you or whatever. Nor can they pay you to vote. Because you could say, yeah, yeah, I'll do what you want, and then go in the ballot box and just cast the vote the way you wanted, and they can't know, as long as we have a secret ballot. All right. So if we want to do the kind of matching of individual records, one way to do it is to put serial numbers on the individual ballots, like over here on the right, the paper ballots have serial numbers. And the electronic records also record the serial numbers. And uh, we can use these to match them up. But of course, in almost every polling place, um, 
it, uh, either a record is kept or a record could be kept of which voters showed up to vote in which order. So knowing that we're auditing uh, rep ballot number three, the third ballot cast on this voting machine, tells us which voters' ballot we're voting. So you can't do this. You could try to put random identifiers, pseudo-random identifiers, generate them at random, generate them cryptographically, I don't care, onto the ballots, and then record those on the electronic record. But how do you as a voter know that the code that's on your ballot actually contains no information about who you are or what the sequence number does? If it's generated randomly or pseudo-randomly, right, it's a theorem that you can't tell that apart from a, a well-encrypted value. You also don't know whether someone... Uh, didn't, whether or not someone wrote down the fact that the top ballot in the pile has uh, serial number 325631 or whatever it is. So voters in this kind of system can't have confidence uh, in the privacy of their ballot. And the voters' confidence in the privacy is what lets them resist vote buying and coercion. So we have a problem if we are going to audit by ballots with, uh, with um, the secret ballot. All right. So now I want to tell you how to solve this problem. And this is a result that Joe Calandrino, Alex Halderman, and I published this year, um, a, a method called machine-assisted auditing. And the idea is this. The first step is we're going to check the electronic records against the paper records by using a recount machine. We're going to use a machine to do the recount. And of course, we don't trust that machine. So the second step is going to be that we're going to audit the machine by doing a random manual recount of, of what the machine did. All right. So it works kind of like this. Um, the first thing we do is we take the paper ballots and we run them through this machine which scans them and counts them and produces two things. First of all, on the bottom, it produces, um, it produces an electronic record of all of the ballots it scanned and what it says was on those ballots um, in order with serial numbers. It also, as a side effect, prints serial numbers on the, ballot, on the, ba on the paper ballots. Now, this is not a voter privacy problem because, remember, uh, before all of this stuff happens at the end of the day in election day, all of the ballots were thrown into a single ballot box. They all got mingled together and shuffled around. And then maybe you shook up the box, maybe not. But anyway, um, the ballots are all mingled together. And then the voters went home. So these serial numbers don't record the order in which the ballots were cast. They just record the order in which the sheets happened to be stacked up in the sheet fed scanner when you, when you did this recount. Right. Now we compare the tally, the electronic tally that the voting machine kept on election day with the result of, the, um, uh, of this machine recount and make sure that the electronic records match. Okay. So now, if this machine is honest, then this audit is good and it will tell us whether there's a discrepancy between the paper and electronic ballots. But we need to audit the machine. The way we do this is like this. We audit the, the recount machine by selecting some of the random ballot some of the ballots at random for human inspection. So we do some random process, and we produce, in this case, um, the decision that we're going to audit ballot number 321 and ballot number 716, which are allegedly cast for Bob and Alice, respectively. So we go into the pile of paper ballots. We pull out those two. We look at them manually, and we compare to the electronic record for those ballots, and we make sure that it's equal. This gives us some kind of check, um, which is valid to some statistical level, on the accuracy of this recount machine, right? And I hope it, uh, uh, and, I, and it should be clear that if we do this in enough places, that we can get enough confidence in the recount machines that, uh, that we know that the result is good. And in fact, I'll assert to you that there's a theorem that says that that's the case. The result of this is that we can use a machine without having to trust it. And uh, this, it turns out, is as efficient as ballot-based auditing. The number of ballots that you have to touch by hand is equal to the number that you would, you would um, audit in, if you were using ballot-based auditing. And it also protects the secret ballot because of the intermediate step. All right, so how much good does this do? Here's some data uh, based on uh, data from the 2006 Virginia US Senate race between Webb and Allen. Uh, if you did, uh, this is a very close race, 0.3% margin of victory, and we want 95% statistical confidence that we'd catch a discrepancy between paper and electronic. As an aside, Virginia doesn't actually use, didn't actually use voter verified paper ballots in this election, but we're pretending that they did and using, and, and using the, uh, the data to do this analysis. All right, so if you did precinct based scanning, you'd have to count about half the ballots, about 1.1 million by hand, in about 1,200 precincts. With machine assisted auditing, we can get down to about 2,300 ballots that are examined by hand in about 1,300 precincts, so about uh, 1 1.7 or 8 ballots per precinct um, uh, examined by hand. 
with the same level of confidence. But it turns out we can do even better um, by thinking more carefully about what it is that we're trying to establish. So the um, our original goal was to reject the hypothesis that more than 5% of the ballots differed. But it turns out that if we think more carefully, all we need to do is reject the hypothesis that more than 5% of 5% or more of the ballots are marked electronically for Alice, but on paper for Bob. That's the scenario we worry about, the scenario where the paper where a paper recount would swing toward Bob. If Alice should have won by more than 10%, we don't care. So, but if we're looking for this hypothesis, this tells us something interesting. If we're looking for ballots that were marked electronically for Alice but on paper for Bob, um, it's immediately obvious we don't need to look at all at any ballots that are marked electronically for Bob because they can't possibly fall into this category. So 45% of the electronic ballots we can just set aside and not look at at all. We only need to audit the ballots that are marked for Alice. Um, now, this is a two-candidate race where there's no write-ins, there's no undervotes or any of that, but it turns out that um, uh, you can work out an algorithm, and we did, um, that is more general. In general, the probability of auditing a ballot can depend on how that ballot is marked. Uh, the intuition being that ballots that are marked for winning candidates get more attention. Ballots that are marked allegedly for losing candidates get less attention. And the full algorithm accounts for multi-candidate races, multi-seat races, undervotes and overvotes, write-ins and all that stuff. And you can prove that it, um, that it um, is as good as the, more, um, the, as the previous auditing method. Now, if you do this, uh, this content-sensitive recounting in the Webb-Allen race, you get about another factor of two saving. So that you now uh, are, are hand, hand counting about 1,100 ballots statewide, about a factor of 1,000 better than the precinct-based method that is what's actually used everywhere, as far as we can tell. And the number of precincts is lower. So by using this content-based method, you can actually um, need to touch fewer precincts at all and, uh, and also touch many fewer ballots than with other, me other methods. All right, so um, I hope I've convinced you at least a little bit that if you use uh, new electronic technologies correctly and creatively, uh, we can make voting cheaper, faster, and more reliable than a paper-based system. You can do better than paper-based. It shouldn't be our goal to get back to where we were before these computers came along, but our goal should be to do better. Where it's possible, we want to design the technology so we don't have to trust it. We want to have the paper trail on the side of an electronic voting, electronic counting system. If we're using machines in recounting, we want to check up on them with manual checking. Uh, research, um, there's a lot of interesting research going on in this area. There are now three uh, conferences or workshops annually on electronic voting um, and some really interesting ideas about how to do better. And we're making really rapid progress on some of the problems we need to solve. On other problems, not so much. But in practice, we have a long way to go. There's a lot we don't understand about what to do. And even if we, we the research community, understood exactly what to do or thought we did, um, there's a long road to get it deployed and all the things we'd learn along the way. And there's a long road to convince public officials uh, to trust, um, uh, to have trust in us and our technologies to, uh, uh, to change things. Uh, thanks. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. We have, I think, just a, a Please minute remember to turn on your microphone. Yes. Yeah, I was two questions. One, how much is the cost of each machine? And the second one is when you are making the counting, why, do, why don't you generate a stack of papers for each count? Just say not the name, but what it's going to be randomly. And when, when you feed it through ah, okay. to check the machine afterwards, just to make sure that it works fine. So how much do the machines cost? The uh, DRE-type electronic voting machines um, cost a few thousand dollars typically. The sort of uh, cheat fed scanner that I talked about is, um, uh, is probably also $1,000 or so for equipment. Um, the, um, the cost of the, voting, of the machines for casting the votes is probably the biggest factor in practice because you need more of them. You need one vote, one vote casting machine for every mm, couple hundred voters probably. Um, whereas the recount machines you might need only a few hundred uh, or a thousand across the whole state of Virginia, for example. Um, the other question is, why don't you sort of randomly select some papers to, um, to, um, to audit? There actually are alternative algorithms where, um, that are sort of cut and choose algorithms where, um, where you ask the voting official to divide the ballots into two pa papers into two piles, and then you choose which one you're going to, you're going to audit. Um, if you're going to divide the ballots into piles based on how they were cast, 
uh, you again have this problem of either you use a machine to do that, and you shouldn't necessarily trust that the machine got it right, uh, or you do it by hand, which is equivalent to, uh, to doing a count. I mean, you Follow. have some name, you have a stack of paper which is generated by computer. Yes. It is printed, and you don't know the numbers. It just gives you then all the numbers separately. You, they just mail it to you or whatever you want. In uh, each machine, you just feed it through, and the number, if it doesn't match with the one that you have, which is secret, you don't know, nobody knows what is in that uh, stack. So, well, th there are various kinds of systems that try to give the, vo the voters some kind of a receipt or some kind of a record that correlates to their vote. Of course, this is a very difficult thing to do because um, the secret ballot says that you can't give the voter a piece of paper that lets them connect their identity to a vote. Um, on the one, so on the one hand, it's difficult to figure out what kind of receipt you can usefully give them. There are some uh, advanced cryptographic methods that try to give the voter something, um, some sort of cryptographically generated receipt that they can then verify against some sort of publicly posted bulletin board of cryptographic values. Um, and there's a whole active research area there. And I think the short answer is that we don't know how to do, really do that in practice. I guess I don't understand. I don't say giving uh, voters any register what is going on. But separately, you have a stack of paper, got yeah. nothing to do with the election. Who, who has voted for whom? But it is predetermined what it is by computer randomly. Okay. And these papers have been printed. Yes. And you just pass it through one of these machines, any one of them. And then you compare the answer that you get with the one which is already predetermined. You, don't, you know in that stack what kind of answer you should get if your machine, machine ah, okay, the counting right. machine, so doesn't can, count it yes. that way. You know there's something wrong with the machine. So can you test the recounting machine by passing through sort of test ballots? Yes. The idea, yes. Um, this is something you should do, um, but uh, this is something you should do. Um, <coughs> This general method is, um, this is an instance of a method called parallel testing, where you uh, essentially hold a pretend election or a pretend count um, and try not to tell the voting machine or recount machine that this is the pretend count instead of the real one. Um, now, there are, there are various methods that countermeasures against this in which the voting machine tries to notice different patterns of, um, or the recount machine tries to notice different patterns that are distinctive between your test deck and the real election. There are methods, um, um, there are so-called secret knock methods where, um, where the official who's conducting this testing somehow tips the machine off by pushing some buttons or, or the timing of something as to what's going on. And this is certainly something you could do, but it's probably by itself not enough safeguard. Uh, if you're interested in talking more about this, we should probably talk more offline. Uh, I'd just like to point out one other thing in, in this, I mean, it's a rather obvious thing, but if you're using these paper trail DREs, there is one other piece of information you need to keep, and that is you need to independently keep track of how many people have voted. Yes, that's right. That, that's absolutely right, and this is, this is something I glossed over yeah. in this presentation. You do need to keep track of how many people have voted. You need to make sure, and this is a routine check that's already done at the yeah. end of election day. The number of cast ballots in the vote polling place matches the number of people who actually showed up and checked in. Uh, at least it's not too far off. Uh, you know, because people being what they are, you yeah. have off by one error every now and then. Um, and this is actually part of any reasonable audit procedure is that in some places, chosen randomly in an appropriate way, you, you verify that that's the case, that the number of papers matches the number of electronic records. And that's actually, if you look in our full paper that describes the machine-assisted recount, there is a step that does that. Yes. Conclude there, and thank Professor Helton once again.